Quite, quite a few years ago, I had an opportunity uh, to host a trip uh, called Footsteps of the Apostles. And so we started in Rome, and then we kind of followed the steps of Paul through some of the areas of Greece and different churches. And in that trip, I had the opportunity to go to the Vatican, uh, to the gallery there in Rome. And in that gallery hangs a famous uh, painting by an artist whose name is Raphael. No, he's not one of the Ninja Turtles. He's an actual artist. And he painted his last painting, and some say that it's uh, one of his most famous, and it hangs there in the gallery of the Vatican. And, and the painting is entitled, The Transfiguration. And, and Neil spoke on that passage of scripture last week. And, and the painting, it, 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 it's, it's kind of in three segments. If you, if you look at it, at the top of the painting, you would see Jesus and shining forth in all his glory, being transfigured. And then you would see Moses on the left and Elijah on the right. And as you scan down, you see Peter, James, and John, the three disciples, sort of shielding their eyes, lying on the ground as this amazing thing is occurring. And then you scan down again and Below them, below those three disciples, there's, there's a picture that, that, that is combined with all the rest that has to do with the context of our message today. There at the bottom are the rest of the disciples and a young boy that's got this fearful look on his face and his father. It's a desperate situation, nine disciples and Jesus is coming down the hillside for this very reason. P Peter, James, and John want to kind of camp out on the mountaintop. Maybe you remember from last week's message here in Mark chapter 9, verse 5. They say, hey, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, 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 let me have your attention. I'm sure these three, Peter and the two sons of thunder, are on a massive spiritual high after seeing and hearing what they saw. I mean, they see Jesus shining whiter than snow. They see the lawgiver, Moses. They see the great prophet, Elijah. There's a cloud of glory that surrounds them. And if that was not enough, there's, a, there's the very voice of God the Father that speaks to them on that mountain. And, and now they're making their way back down to ground level. And, and let me say this, nothing wrong with mountaintop great spiritual experiences. But the reality is we don't stay there. We come back down into real life great times of worship, great, great times of ministry, but, but uh, real life always waits in front of us, doesn't it? We come back to parenting, we come back to the job, we come back to, 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 to life as it is. We come back to people who are lost, who are hurting, and we're called to share his love and his grace. It never goes well. I, I'm actually doing a funeral Tuesday for someone who once attended church here. And, and you know, it, life, life, it, it just is filled with all kinds of things. So, so Jesus leads them down the mountain to continue their ministry. And, he, and he's on his way. He's, he's telling them he's on his way to the cross. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And we pick up our story here in Mark chapter 9. Verse 14, and when he came to his disciples, the, the other nine, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. And immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, well, what are you discussing with them. Jesus comes down from the mountain 
and his men are surrounded by people and scribes and, and there's disputing, there's quarreling, there's arguing. And, and suddenly now Jesus is, is back down in the valley and, and he's obviously very recognizable because it tells us here in verse 15, immediately when they, the people saw him, they were greatly amazed and they're all running to him. Jesus now very popular, very known, and, and he's back. He's back in the crowds. He's, he's back in the, the religious arguing and debating. He's somewhat back in the heat of the battle, if you will. So he asked them the question, and then one of the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out. But they couldn't do it. Now, now listen for a moment as I just pull some passages from other Gospels that speak of this same situation. In Matthew chapter 17, it says the father came and, and, and bowed on his knees. He's begging before Jesus. It says that, that often the spirit throws him into the water, tries to drown him, and other times it throws him in the fire and tries to burn him. In Luke 9, a, a word that is used for this child, it can be, I think, interpreted as the child being around the age of four to five years old. Anybody have a four or five year old child or a grandchild? Some of you are saying, I wish I didn't, but you do. <laughs> but but there, that's just an amazing age, a four year old, a five year old. In so many ways, right? And so here's this little boy. He, it also tells us that, he's, that he can't speak and, and he can't hear. And in Luke 9, it says that when he's thrown to the ground, he screams. And so here's this desperate father on his knees describing to Jesus, your, your disciples couldn't help me, and now here you are. And, and I want to pause here for just a second. Because the enemy of your life and my life is at war with mankind. All those who have been created in the image of God. And many times, the battle, although it may not find itself into your life in a demonic way. It certainly finds itself in many lives in a mental and moral way. The Washington Post and, and other data points that, did you know two-thirds of the school shootings and killings have been done by children under the age of 18 and the median age for those shooters are 16 years old? T tell me the enemy's not after kids. Just like this picture we have here. There have been more mass shootings in the days of the year in 2023. I, I don't know if you realize this. Uh, I, I went out of the country recently, and I'm talking to some people about America, and they all kind of look at me and go, boy, America's in trouble, isn't it? They see what's going on in cities like Seattle and San Francisco. I don't know if you've paid much attention to what's going on in some of the large cities in our country, but they're in big trouble. It's crazy what's going on. Over 25,000 people have been killed in gun violence scenarios, including children's taking their own lives and the lives of their parents in our country this year. Satan has come to kill, still and destroy. Listen to what Jesus says in, in the Gospel of, of John. I'll just read it to you. John chapter 10. He says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come, however, that they might have life and they may have it more abundantly. What a contrast. And so Jesus steps into this scenario, into this situation where the thief has come to kill and destroy. And it's certainly being seen and recognized in our culture today. People are involved in all kinds of darkness. 
sensually, sexually, spiritually, the, 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 the people who are, who are losing their lives over fentanyl and heroin suicide, the door, is, the door is pretty wide open these days. And as a pastor, as a father, as a grandfather now, I would say to you, man, protect your kids. Pray for your kids. You and I, if you're anywhere near my age, which is somewhere around, then you would probably know <laughs> that when you were raising your kids, you didn't have to deal with this, this video thing that your kids all have now. I, I, in some ways, thank God I didn't have to fight that battle. But it's a doorway, it's a gateway for the enemy into your children's life. And we see the struggle, you know, of darkness and light, Christ and the enemy in our text today. He, he comes down off the mountain with his three disciples, and they had this glorious time together. There's Elijah, there's Moses, and they're excited. And then you have this contrast. It's an obvious contrast that's been painted for us by, by Mark, out of, the, out of the transfiguration from light now to darkness, from let us worship you and build three tabernacles to, to blasphemy, from the power to the inability of the disciples to stand against this brokenness and this pain. And it's a crazy situation. And Jesus steps right into the middle of it. And he, and he gives a, 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 a response here in verse 19. I, I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, verse 18, but they couldn't do it. And so he answered, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Br bring, bring the child to me. Jesus responds with a genuine emotional cry, I believe, from the heart. And he uses the word, oh. It's a word in scripture that's very rarely used speaking to people personally or directly. But he uses it here. Who's he speaking to? The disciples? The scribes? The, the crowd that is gathered? I would respond, yes, yes, yes. In our language, it's kind of like we would say, will you ever get it? Will, 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 will you ever learn? This is kind of a harsh and, and a surprising statement from Jesus. It's, it's like he's saying, are you not paying attention at all? Br bringing to me. And they brought him, verse 20. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Very, very graphic scenario before Jesus and for the crowd and for the disciples and this father. And so, so Jesus here, he, he, he kind of draws the father out in verse 21. He says, how long has this been happening to him? It's almost like he's, he's letting the father emotionally vent what's been going on in his life for four to five years or maybe longer. The father responds, he said, from, from childhood. And as often as, as he has thrown him both into the fire, tried to burn him alive, and into water to drown him, to destroy him. But, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The father is able to open up, to share, to, to express his heart and his desperation. And, and I think Jesus does this intentionally to give the guy the chance to, to, to explain, to vent. And sometimes that's a good thing to do. And there's his boy there, there in the dirt being convulsed and unable to talk or unable to hear what's going on. And he says, if you can do anything, Jesus, ha have some love, ha have compassion on us and, and help us. And Jesus responds, if I can do anything. I, I mean, he knows, he, he knows who he is. 
And he asked him, well, if you can, if you can believe, then all things are possible to him who believes. This is a crazy, amazing uh, uh, encounter. A, a loving father, a compassionate Jesus. I don't think anyone cares more than Jesus. And the father says, if you can do it. And Jesus says, no, if you can believe. This had to be one of those kind of, of, of time-expanding moments where Jesus and this man have locked eyes and the boy's on the ground and everyone's on edge and the crowd is surrounded. This is one of those verses in the Bible that if you're not careful, people rip or take out of context. This part here where it says, you know, if, if, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believe. Some people take this passage out of context and kind of turn Jesus into a genie in a bottle. Well, if you can believe all things are possible. I have enough faith, all my wishes will come true. Almost like faith controls God. And it ends up being some kind of, if you're not careful, faith in faith instead of faith in God. Not faith and trust in Christ and his love and his sovereignty. I mean, Jesus is in the middle of this crowd with this man, his son, my only son. I've come for your help. He, he, disciples couldn't do it. This is a desperate heart, a broken heart, a father reaching out for his son, this is what he's asking for. And Jesus is saying, well, do, you, do you have faith enough for your son? He's not asking for a lake house. Lord, I would, yeah, by faith I claim that lake house in the mountains. That's not what he's asking for. He's not asking for a new boat, Mercedes Benz. This is about believing and trusting Jesus and his father. Uh, he breaks down. Look at verse 24. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, he's weeping, Lord, I, I, I do believe, but help my unbelief. You ever felt that? The, the, the tense there of, the, of that verb is, is, is Lord, I, I believe and I'm believing, but and every day, continually, I'm believing. But help me. Help me believe more. Help, help me to trust you more. Because we live down here in this real world where kids do die and situations are hard. And I think we've all felt times where, Lord, I, I pray, I, I, I read your word, but, but I don't always know. I struggle with trust sometimes. And in verse 25, the, the people are pressing in. When, when Jesus saw the people, they're, they're running together. And he, 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 so he rebukes the unclean spirit. Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. As the crowd grows larger and the, the father's more emotional and desperate, he rebukes the spirit. Now, please know, Jesus is not trying to draw a crowd here. He's about the father and his love for this young boy. So, so he casts out this, this spirit. And look what he says. I, I command you, verse 25, to come out of him and enter him no more. He does two things. Get out and don't return. Or we might phrase it like this, hit the road jack and don't come back. <laughs> right? That's what he says. Very emphatic. Je Jesus takes full authority. And there in verse 26, the spirit cried out, convulsed him again greatly, came out of him, and he became as one dead. And many looked at the child and said, he is dead. Similar to what we saw early in Scripture with Jairus' daughter, Jesus responds. And he takes him by the hand, just like he did the daughter of Jairus, and lifted him up, and he arose. The little boy 
stands up, and probably for the first time in his life, he hears and he can talk. And Luke tells us in chapter 9, he presented him to his father, or he gave him to his father. And the disciples say, when they came into the house, why could we not cast it out? And he said, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Lord, why couldn't we pull it off? Lord, you sent us out before and we cast out demons and you gave us power, you gave us authority. And many think that, that the reason they couldn't was because these disciples were living off past spiritual experience and events. Jesus is saying this, this spiritual power and authority comes from fresh daily relationship with the Father through prayer and with fasting, with communion with him. Faith that has strength, faith that has authority, faith that has power is faith that is in a real relationship daily with the Lord. You know, it's interesting when you, when you pastor a church, I've, I've been doing this, believe it or not, for 40 years. And it's interesting how you watch people that you're friends with and who are Christians. They, they kind of reach a certain place in their faith, and it's sort of like, okay, this is far as I'm going. They don't pray much anymore. They don't serve much anymore. The, 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 they, they, they just kind of live off, you know, their old spiritual life. You know, one of the things in, in talking to Pastor Neil about, and he, he's wanting to implement as we step into the fall, is, is more prayer time for us as a, as a body of believers. Coming together and praying together and, and focusing on that in our lives. See, Jesus comes from the mountaintop, from, from shining in all his glory with, with Moses representing the law and, and, and Elijah representing the prophets, and he's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the law. He comes back into the valley, back where there's arguing and discussion and pain and hurt and evil and unbelief. And he's continuing his ministry of rescuing people from the enemy. In some ways, it's a, it's a, it's a picture, if you will. It, it, it's a... It's a I think an obvious look of Jesus as he originally comes down from heaven. He leaves all his glory and all his majesty and he comes to earth to rescue people like you and me. You say, well, I'm not demon possessed. Have you talked to your friends lately? <laughs> I don't have issues. Oh, yeah, you do. We all have issues. We all live in this broken, crazy society, and, and Jesus left heaven to come to earth to rescue people like you and me. Amen. Aren't you glad he did? Oh, I'm so glad he rescued me. You know, there's, there's a movie out right now. I've, I've not seen it called The Sound of Freedom. And it's about people rescuing. This is, this is how much trouble our country and, and our world is. It's about people rescuing children from sex trafficking. My, my wife wouldn't go see the movie, and I don't know if I want to either, but, but I've talked to people who have. And, and imagine the, the, the look on a parent's face or, or a father's face when, when, when someone pulls back up to their home and they've rescued their son or their daughter from this evil that happens in our country and in our world of children sold into some kind of sex trafficking and they're rescued out of it and brought home. Can you imagine? Well, this is what Jesus does. He rescues people from all kinds of things in life. And one day, listen, one day this, 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 this Lord and Savior Jesus who, who came from heaven to rescue us, one day he'll present you and I back to the Father. What a great picture. 
He'll, 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 he'll take us and restore us to the Father and say, look, they're without sin. They're without fault. They're without out anything. I, I've washed them. I've cleansed them. I've forgiven them. And I'm restoring them back completely whole. Now they can speak. Now they can see. And now they can hear your voice, Father. And that's a great picture of what's happening here in some ways as Jesus makes his way from, from, from this beautiful, amazing mountaintop experience and he comes back down into the world where there's all the evil and unbelief and arguing and, you know, finger pointing at Jesus and his men. And he restores this young boy and he presents him back to his father. What an awesome thing Jesus does. And you might be here today. You say, well, I'm not sure I, I have belief. I, I would say to you the same thing Jesus said to this man. You might say, well, Jesus, can you heal me? Can you restore me? Can you save me? Can you forgive me? He would say to you, can you believe? Can you trust me? You know, a lot of people get hung up on belief and say, well, you know, I just don't know if I could believe. I just don't know if I could, you know, uh, accept all this stuff in the Bible or who Jesus is or, or whatever. You know, when I came to the Lord, I didn't know anything about the Bible. All I knew was I needed to be rescued. I was a high school dropout. I had, I had used drugs, uh, broken my mom's heart. I had all this stuff in my life. I, I was only 18, 19 years old. But boy, did I know I needed to be rescued. There, there was a sense of loneliness inside, a sense of guilt, a sense of what am I doing with my life, even though I, I thought I was doing great stuff. I mean, I was surfing. What could be better than that? <laughs> Traveling. Well, at 17, I'm in a van with, with my older brother who became a pro surfer going from Miami to Maine, just living in surf shops and showing films and surfing and meeting all these people, wearing cool clothes. <laughs> but just as lost as you could possibly be, 60s, early 70s, lots of drugs, crazy time. And in the quietness of night at some times or when I was alone, I would think, Gosh, is this, is this what I'm going to do? And there's this wonderful person named Jesus who, who began to knock on the door of my heart, began to call me to himself. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know what I would believe. But I knew I needed to be rescued. I knew, knew I had guilt and I had shame in my life. And I, and I knew I needed something more than what I had. See, here's the answer to this question in Scripture. He can, if you will. I always told my kids, you've probably heard me say this a million times, as, I, as my children were growing up, I'd say this, God has a plan for your life, because I didn't know that when I was growing up. But I also told them this, so does the enemy. And you'll choose day by day whose plan you'll follow. You'll follow the enemy's plan, which, which I did most of my young life, or you'll follow God's plan. I didn't know God had a plan for me. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't understand what salvation meant. Even after I became a Christian, I was a brand new Christian when I started going to Bible college. And, I'm, and I began to realize, wow, there's a lot more to Jesus than I ever realized. There's a lot more to following him than I ever expected. And then I realized that Jesus not only wanted to save me, he not only wanted to forgive me, he not only wanted to heal me of all these different pains and hurts in my life, but he also wanted to use me. Lord, you can use me. Oh, yeah, you're a perfect candidate. He wants to present you to the Father cleansed, forgiven, and made whole. Not only would you be able to speak for him, but you'll also be able to hear his voice. You say audibly? Well, I, I've never experienced that. Some of you may have. But he's spoken to me a million times through people and through this. What a powerful thing it is. If you'll let him. Jesus says, I can if you will. If you'll believe. And that, that seems to have been my experience all through my spiritual life. The Lord would say, I, I can 
if you will. You know, God, God never does your part for you. Have you recognized that? And I've always found out he waits for you to step out. I would submit to you that 99.9% .9 of the time, you're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to go, must I always wait on you? Oh, you faithless generation. I feel that sometimes. God, God says, look, I gave you everything you need. Now step out and do something with it. I've given you resources and all this in your life. What are you doing? Well, God, I, can, can you? Yeah, if you will. And uh, maybe today God's speaking to you about something in your life. God, can I stop drinking? Well, yeah, if you will. Can I stop using drugs? Yeah, if you will. Can I stop being sexually immoral in my life and trafficking in places I should? Yeah, if, if, you, if you'll trust me, if you will. And he can heal and he can forgive and he can restore. But you know what he says? This, this kind doesn't come out except for by fasting and prayer. This kind doesn't come out except by a genuine day-by-day -day relationship with the Lord. And I would submit to you, you never stop growing in Jesus Christ. You don't go just, just get saved and say, okay, I got it. Oh, no. That's just the very beginning. Jesus has come down in some sense from the mountain. And he stepped into our world. And he wants to heal. He wants to restore. And he wants to, in, in a very real way, present you to the Father. How wonderful will that be one day when we step out of this valley into heaven presented to the Father by Jesus Christ and there's no longer any accusations, there's no longer any pain, there's no longer any hurt or evil or unbelief. He came to rescue us from the enemy and I'm so glad he did.